And we left off in Acts chapter 16. Well, we finished up 15. Basically, in Acts chapter 15, you'll recall that Paul and Barnabas got the bright idea that they should go back out on the mission field. They, five years previous at uh, Acts chapter 16 standards is five years since their missionary journey. Doesn't seem like that long. It's just last chapter, but uh, a couple chapters ago. But at any rate, it's been five years since they went out, Paul and Barnabas, through uh, through the island of Cyprus and through modern day Turkey and all, and they were leading people to Christ and they're planting churches. And so they get the idea, well, let's, let's go back and, and let's strengthen the churches <clears throat> that we planted. Um, Paul and Barnabas have a disagreement. We talked about that last week. They decide that they're going to go in two different teams and not together. Paul uh, takes uh, Silas uh, and um, Barnabas takes John Mark, his nephew, uh, they go to the island of Cyprus, and then Silas and Paul now is, uh, were picking them up. It says that they went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches in the last verse of chapter 15, verse 41. But now we pick it up in verse 16, and it says, then he, Paul and Silas by implication, came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but... His father was Greek, and that but his father was Greek seems to suggest that maybe he wasn't a follower of the way. Uh, verse 2, he, Timothy, was well spoken of um, by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. And so, verse 5, the churches were strengthened, that's key, the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. That's what you want for your church. You want to see it be strengthened, and the members, when we talk about the church, it's you, it's, it's me, it's us together, we are the church. And so you want to be strengthened, and you want to, and you want to see God add daily to the church, such as should be saved, and, and, and all. This is, this is what we hope for. And, you know, by way of introduction here to what's going on, I'm reminded of a story that a pastor told. I've shared it before, so maybe you've heard me, me share it. But there was a pastor who was pastoring in, in Florida, rather large church, and um, and one day the cops show up uh, to his church and a secretary comes in. She says, hey, the police are here. They're, they're, they're asking for you. And, uh, and so, <laughs> okay, okay. So, uh, so he meets the, 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 the cops and they, they say, hey, look, we've got an armed hostage situation and the guy's asking for you. And would you come with us? And so he, he goes and he tells this elaborate story how he gets there and in its classic situation, the guy, you can see him out there, he's brandishing a gun um, and he's got you know, a hostage you know, next to him um, so that they don't take him out. And he tried to rob the bank, obviously unsuccessfully. And so there, you know, it's, the SWAT team is there and the sniper is you know, right, he's in this alleyway, this pastor and the sniper is just right there next to him. And you know, they give him the bullhorn and um, they say, hey, we got your pastor here, you know, whatever the pastor you asked for. And he's talking to this guy. Well, this guy had had, had you know, encounters with this pastor. He'd counseled with him, and he was just he, he just couldn't get things on track. And he just was very, you know, having massive, obviously, massive troubles in his life. And so uh, the pastor's talking to him. Well, well, the conversation doesn't go very well. And, uh, and so the guy makes this decision, this, this hostage taker makes the decision that he's going to, you know, suicide by copy kind of thing. And so he, he brandishes his weapon, aims his weapon, and he starts charging at, at the police. And at this moment, the sniper, mere feet from this pastor, uh, with, he takes his shot. And because it's a military weapon and with one pull of the trigger, three rounds go out, hit this guy, and he just drops like a sack of potatoes, and he's dead right there in front of him. Well, the story doesn't end there because the obviously, you know, horrible thing to process, uh, 
you know, this deafening thing and the ears ringing and the pastor just like, what just happened kind of thing. Well, the next day, uh, the bank manager calls for the same pastor, says, look, we got, we've, we've got a room full of employees. Everybody's pretty shook up about what happened yesterday. Would you come, would you come talk to these guys, help them process through what's going on, trying to debrief here, you know, crisis counseling, so to speak. So the pastor goes, and as he's on his way, he feels like the Lord gives him a scripture to share. And here's the scripture he shared with him when he got there, Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But, Jesus cautioned, everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended. Notice it doesn't say if the rain descended. It says, you know, the storms are coming. He says, it's the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. And having read this scripture to those gathered, he said, what you all heard yesterday, and he's referring to that shot and the deafening ringing in the ears. He says, what you all heard yesterday was the sound of a man falling. He heard the words of Jesus, but he didn't heed them. And the Bible is clear, and we pray it every week when we gather that we are not to be hearers only, but we are to be doers of the word. And that prayer originates from something that James said in James chapter one. He said, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourselves. And here's the idea. The idea is that our works and our actions serve as an evidence of a faith that is based upon the genuine foundation of Jesus Christ. And this foundation is established when we hear and we heed the gospel and we profess Christ as our Lord and Savior, and it then continues as we build on that foundation. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthians, speaking of building on a foundation, He said, for we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building, and according to the grace of God which was given to me as a wise builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what worth it is, what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward Uh, If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now, I tell you this because today we're joining Paul. I should say rejoining Paul because we've been with him now for several chapters. Um, And he's heading back out on the mission field with Silas. And the purpose of the trip is to strengthen and check up on these churches that he and Barnabas planted. Now, and for those of you that have kids, you will understand what I'm about to say uh, very personally. Um, That having the right foundation and having your kids be on that right foundation and and successfully building on that foundation it doesn't just magically happen, does it? You know, it's, it's just not like, you know, you don't ever have to do any work where your kids are concerned. 
They're a lot of work daily, lots of work, you know, to, to make sure that they've, that they're building, that they're on the right foundation to begin with and that they're building on that foundation. It takes careful attention. It takes a lot of work, uh, a lot of tears, and there's a lot of different aspects to it. Um, and, and this is true both in our own growth and development, and it's also true in the growth and development of those that we have to lead. And so why do I tell you all this? I tell you this because today in our text, as we're going through here, we're going to see four ways that the church is strengthened. We read through Acts, and it's a history book. And it's really easy just to think, like, like I'm a... I love history. I geek out on history. Uh, if, if I go to Washington, D.C., I want to read all the plaques and spend all the time. And my wife hates history and doesn't want to have anything to do with that, right? And so what, what I don't want you to do when we read through the book of Acts is to kind of glass over and go, oh, that this, this is just a history book about what happened 2,000 years ago. It is a history book of what happened 2,000 years, but history instructs us. You know, I, I can remember historically, I think back in my own life, my father, uh, as a kid, going down to the beach, and, you know, this was probably the late 60s at this time, and, and um, you know, we were down at the beach, and there was a guy tripping on LSD, and everybody, and everybody watches as this guy stumbles his way into the water, and he's drowning, and everybody's watching. Nobody's doing a thing. I have no idea where the lifeguards were, but they weren't there. And all of a sudden, my dad runs into the water, and he rescues this guy, and, you know, as, as a five-year-old kid, that, that sticks, right? And it's a historical event, but I'll tell you what it did. It, it informed me, who I became, who I would be, that, that I, yes, I am my brother's keeper. Yes, there is, you know, the, 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 there are times when, when people need you. I've never met him. He's never done anything for me. He'll never do anything for me. And yet, he, he needs help and I'm gonna be the one to help. That, that was an instructive lesson from history. And so today, instructively from history, we're gonna see four ways that the church is strengthened. Number one, if you're taking notes, the church is strengthened through perseverance. Church is strengthened through perseverance. Verse 16, again, then he, Paul, came to Derby and Lystra. Now, stop right there. Think about... Derby and Lystra, he'd been there before, right? First missionary journey, planted a church. What happened to Paul when he was in Lystra? Anybody remember? They received him and Barnabas as gods. You guys, are, they worshiped him as a god. And, uh, you know, you might think, oh, that, that would be handy if I'm trying to go into a town and preach the gospel and, and I want people to be receptive. Like, that's a pretty good start, right? Um, but Paul recognized what an absolute horrifying mistake that would be. Uh, mistake is the wrong word. It would be, it would be blasphemous. It would, it would just be a train wreck for everybody involved. And so he was really quick to tell everybody, I, I, I ain't no God. I am not a God. He is not a God. Uh, we are mere men. We are just like you. Uh, but we're here to tell you about the true and living God. Well, all the people needed to hear was that they weren't God, and so they're like, oh, you're not God? All right, we're gonna kill you. And, and so what did they do? They beat Paul, and they beat Barnabas, and they drug Paul outside of the city, and they left him for dead. They thought that he was dead, and he might have been. Like, Paul writes about how he was caught up to the third heaven, and, you know, some people speculate that's when he did it. He actually died, and God, you know, revived him, and we don't know, but we do know they beat the snot out of him, right? Now, if you go somewhere and they beat the snot out of you, where's the last place you're going back to? That place, right? Well, when you read the story, Paul came to, they're like, Paul, snap out of it. And he comes to, he goes right back into Lystra and ministers in Lystra. Like, you're like, dude, why on earth and now here again, he's going right back into Lister. And you go, why on earth would Paul do that? Here's why. Because Paul understood what being a disciple really means. That's what Paul understood. See, Jesus said this. He says, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, that's key. He says, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. 
Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and sisters. And, and he's not saying you need to hate everybody and period. He's saying you should love God so much that by comparison, it looks like you hate everybody else. That's what he's saying. He says, and in, while you're at it, yes, even your own life. He said, otherwise, you can't be my disciple. See, following Christ means that we take our orders from him, right? We don't, we don't take our orders from our comforts. We don't take our orders from our conveniences. We don't take our orders from our conventions, like, oh, this is, you know, the way things are normally done, so this is the way I'm going to do it. It doesn't work like that. Following Christ means it's not about my comfort, it's about his will. It's not about my convenience, it's about his will, right? You think about Mark chapter six. Jesus, you know, he's, he's, his disciples have been out working, they're exhausted. Hey, you know, we're gonna go on a retreat. Great, they all get in the boat. They think they're going on a retreat. They get to the other side, there's a multitude of people. Jesus is like, oh, you know, no, we said retreat, but we got to minister to these people. Uh, suck it up, guys. Here we go. And they minister to them all day long. And then all of a sudden, one of the disciples say, hey, uh, the people are hungry. Send them away. Right? And I, I think that's code. Maybe it's like we're hungry and we're tired. And, you know, this would be a great place if it wasn't for all these people. Get rid of them, Lord, and give us our retreat. That's, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but, I'm, but I, I don't think so. Um, but at any rate, what does Jesus say to them when they say, hey, send them away? Jesus said, you feed them. You feed them. I don't care if it's uncomfortable for you. I don't care if it's inconvenient for you. I, I don't care if it's, if it's not the way that things are normally done. I want you to do that. And of course, the miracle of the fishes and the loaves followed. But think about it. What is supposed to be the defining characteristic of being a Christ follower? Love, love. In John 13, 35, Jesus said, all men will know that you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you've heard it, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, Get a good lawyer. No, he doesn't say that. He says, uh, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him uh, too. Give to him who asks you. And from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do, do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Love, it's the defining characteristic. And, and this is what compels Paul to go back into Lystra, the, right, the, the night that he's beaten and left for dead, it, what compels him to go back into Lystra now. And as well, James tells us that when we do preserve in times of trial, that ultimately it makes us stronger, right? He said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. And so, so th this is how we behave as a disciple of Christ, as an other-centered, loving individual who, who Christ died for. I'm going to do this by an act of the will. I may not feel like it, but I'm going to do it by choice because that's what the Bible says that, that I should do. And I'm not doing it to earn brownie points with God or, or to you know, ensure my salvation. No, I'm doing it because it is how I work out my salvation. 
It, it is the fruit of how I live my life as a, as a new creation in Christ, then, then my works are gonna demonstrate that I'm building on the right foundation. Well, not only do we preserve sacrificially by faith and it makes us stronger, but it makes other people stronger as well. And that leads us to the second point, if you're taking notes, the church is strengthened through discipleship. The church is strengthened through discipleship. Uh, look again, Acts 16, he comes to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman uh, who believed, but his father was Greek. And he, Timothy, was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. The last time Paul was in Lystra, yeah, they beat him, they drug him out, they left him for dead, but he got up and he went back in, and his courage and his wisdom to go back in in the face of these obstacles, it built a great legacy in the people of Lystra, which included these guys like Timothy, right? Now, we know from 2 Timothy that Timothy's mother was a gal named Eunice, and his grandmother was a gal named Lois, and they were both very strong Christians. The, we, we can see that in the scriptures. And in fact, a lot of people speculate, we don't know if this is true or not, but it's speculated that you know, these two gals may well have received Christ when Paul went back into Lystra, when he's faithful to preach you know, the gospel there. Um, it's interesting to consider, and it begs the question, what if Paul had quit? What if Paul faced the hardship? What if they beat him? And he said to everybody in Lister, he's like, well, you know what? Y'all can go to hell, right? And what if he said that? I'm not going back in there. I'm not, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna minister the gospel to you and save you from hell. You guys, clearly, this is how you treat somebody who's trying to help you? Good luck, right? And he could have done that. Thank God he didn't. But what if he had quit? My buddy Dave Shepherdson, he was one of the guys that planted Revival Christian Fellowship with me when we first started the church, um, and uh, he now pastors Calvary Chapel Nuevo. And Dave always says, all Satan has to do is get you to quit. That's all he's got to do. If he's going to win in your life to derail you and train wreck you, all he's got to do is get you to quit. And you know that's true, because he'll whisper those th that in your ear from time to time, in your marriage. You go through a time, you know, you have an argument or whatever, and there's this little voice that says, quit, just quit, right? And, and, and there's a hundred other situations where Satan's just whispering, just quit, just give up. You know, I, I think about, you, talk about history geek, you know the, Con, the Comstock mine in Colorado, it's like the biggest silver mine in history, I think, in the United States? Uh, the guy that sold the rights to that, he was looking for gold, and he just kept getting this, this weird mud mixture, and he's like, this, play, this claim is worthless. He sold the claim for nothing, right? And then somebody realized, oh, all this mud that they're getting out, it's actually really high-grade high silver. And it, and, it, and it wasn't a gold mine, it was a silver mine, and it's, <clears throat> the guy lost his shorts. Why? Because he quit. He, 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 he gave up on it. And Timothy here, he, he's a guy, he's gonna become Paul's right-hand man. We're gonna read about him a lot in the New Testament. Uh, he, he will brag on him, Paul will brag about him in the book of Philippians, say, I've got nobody else like-minded like Timothy. Right, this, this guy is a, is a huge help to me. And, um, and what prepared Timothy for that service? What was it that prepared him? Well, although verse one hints that maybe his father was an unbeliever, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois, they were really active in their faith, right? And, um, and you know, thank you, Paul, for being active in your faith. Thanks for not giving up. Thanks for not quitting. Thanks for being faithful, you know, to... to just to be a disciple, to be strengthened in discipleship and to strengthen others in, in, in that discipleship. 
And you know, verse two here, it shows us that Eunice and Lois, that they, they did a really good job of passing on their faith to young Timothy. It's been said, an ounce of mother is worth a pound of pastor, right? And so they're, there they are, they're ministering. Now, having said that, you know, like I said, Timothy didn't have a believing father. He turned out okay, thank you, Jesus. But dads, your role is so much more important than you could ever know. Uh, according to data that was collected by the Promise Keepers and by the Baptist Press, it tells us this, if a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. However, if a father goes to church regularly, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will attend church as adults. Another study focused on weekly Bible studies. They call them Sunday school, um, but, but it's, it's basically, they're talking about a weekly Bible study. And they found similar results on the impact of fathers. Here's some, some, some statistics. When both parents attend Bible study, in addition to the Sunday service, 72% of their children attend Sunday school when they are grown, Bible study. Uh, when only the father attends Sunday school, 55% of the children attended uh, when grown. Uh, when only the mother attends Sunday school, 15% of the children attend when grown. When neither parent attends Sunday school, only 6% of the children attend Bible study when they are grown. Listen, the best gift that you can give your kids is your faith. It's the best gift that you can give your kids. I, I thank God that, that I have a believing mother and father, a praying mom, and a, and a faithful father who, who was very, the day my daughter was born, first child, my dad gave me a book, and on the inside, or a book, he gave me the Bible, and he inscribed this in the inside. He, he said, um, he said, guide your family by, by Jesus. He said, the words of Christ are absolute truth. If anybody else tells you anything different, they're lying. He said, if you set your, your life by the gospel of Christ, you'll gain eternal life. Amen. Thank God for parents that do that. And we need to be those kind of parents. Third point, third, third instructive thing that we see here, the church is strengthened through patterned behavior. Notice with me again in verse one that the spotlight is immediately on a certain disciple named Timothy, right? They're shining the spotlight on Timothy. And verse two emphasizes that he was well spoken of. And the idea is that Timothy distinctively, this is an important word to emphasize, he distinctively stood out from everybody else. Now, what, what should simultaneously happen this should prompt you to consider two things simultaneously. Number one, why did Timothy stand out? And number two, you should ask yourself, do I stand out? Do I stand out? See, Timothy's action stood out because he patterned his behavior after Jesus Christ, and as a result, he had a good reputation. And as a matter of fact, I would say this, Timothy patterned his behavior after Jesus as Jesus was taught to him by Lois and Eunice, his mother and grandmother, right? And so, so this is how his actions were patterned. Now, patterning our behavior is significant because it gives others a pattern to follow also, Right, G, uh, Paul said this to the Philippians. He said, brethren, join in following my example, my pattern, and take, take note, those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. We, 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 can, we are being a, a pattern for you, and you need to follow my example. Um, First Thessalonians uh, chapter two uh, says, for this reason, this is Paul again, uh, for this reason, we also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, 
which also effectively works in you who believe, for you, brethren, here it is, became imitators uh, of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. What Paul says here, he goes, look, not only did you welcome the word and its supernatural work in your heart, but you became imitators of the churches around you. That word imitators is uh, the Greek word mimic, right? And, and so, so he's saying you're mimicking other Christians and it's serving to your benefit. And this is what Timothy did. He mimicked his grandmother, his mother, uh, and ultimately they were mimicking uh, Paul and they're all mimicking Jesus Christ, right? Um, mimicking is an essential part of human development. Uh, scientists have discovered that from birth, newborns begin mimicking certain facial expressions. And as children grow, mimicking then becomes a major aspect of their growth and of their development. It's absolutely vital to their development of language. It's vital to their development of social skills. Um, and it's very instructive for us to consider what drives toddler imitation. Writing for Parents Magazine, Dr. Lisa Nalvin, she's a developmental and behavioral specialist, and she said this, she says, it's the instant connection that mimicry creates between parent and child that drives all mimicking behavior, it connects us, right? And it's all about bonding with daddy. Apply that to your faith and mimicking the Lord. Instantly connects us, bonds us to the Father, right? Um, and as well, doctors have determined before physical mimicking ever occurs, it's preceded by a considerable amount of study. The idea is that your children are studying you. And the people who are in your circle of influence are studying you. They're taking their cues from you, right? According to Dr. Daniel Kessler, he's a director of development, developmental and behavioral pediatrics uh, at the Children's Health Center of St. Joseph's Hospital in Phoenix, he said this, children spend a lot of time observing and processing information before they attempt mimicking. They're studying you, watching you like a hawk, and, they, and, they, and they're processing this. And they've concluded that this imitation, and I'm going somewhere with this, all right, it follows a four-step process. Number one, uh, the kid watches or the person you're influencing watches and listens, right? Uh, they then process the information, then they copy the behavior, and finally, they practice the behavior. And the Bible backs this up. The Bible says, as dear children, we're supposed to do the same. We're to be, Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God as dear children. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, uh, Paul would say, Imitate me, mimic me, just as I also imitate Jesus Christ. And so now my hope is that you start taking a walk with this and you ask yourself, well, who am I mimicking? Who are you mimicking? Take a walk with that. Who are you mimicking? What's distinctive about your walk with God? Right? Timothy he had a distinctive pattern. He stood out. There was a certain man. He, look at this guy, and he's well regarded, right? What's your pattern? What are other people saying about you? Well, this brings us to our fourth and final point, and that's this. The church is strengthened through loving sacrifice. Look at verses three through five. It says, when Paul wanted to have uh, Timothy go, with him, uh, go on with him, on this missionary journey, strengthening the churches. Um, he wanted him to, and so he took him and he circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Didn't we just deal with circumcision? Right? And, and wasn't there a whole rigmarole about circumcision? There absolutely was. Right? And, and what are they actually doing on this trip? 
They got a letter in their possession that they're sharing with everybody that says, you don't need to be circumcised in order to be saved. So Paul took him and circumcised, like what is going on here, right? Hold that thought. Uh, Verse four, and as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were, it's reminding us of the letter, determined by the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. And hey, they accomplished their, their mission. Verse five, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in number daily. All right, so what's the deal? Why are you having him circumcised when you just had this big fight to say circumcision isn't a big deal? Here's why. Because when he had the, the, the contention about circumcision, it had to do with the doctrine of salvation. That's what he was getting crystal clear. We'll go to war over this closed-hand issue of the doctrine of salvation. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's what the Bible teaches. Stop, full stop, you're done. That's how you're saved, right? And Paul goes to war over those that are coming and saying, no, that's not how you're saved. You gotta be circumcised to get saved. So so that's why they made the big deal about circumcision. But you'll recall, what else did they say when they gave him these letters and said, okay, go back? What what they said was, you're going to go back, you're going to tell everybody you're not saved by the acts of the law, like circumcision or keeping the law of Moses. That's not going to save you. What's going to save you is your belief in Christ and receiving him as your Lord and Savior and letting him make you a new creation. So so that's, that's settled doctrine. However you got to keep in mind you're going to Jews. You're going into a Jewish culture. They've been raised according to Jewish law. And so what we need to do is we need to minimize anything that's going to hinder them receiving the gospel. And so, so circumcision or, or you know, going and, and their instructions to these new Gentile believers was, you know, don't go flaunting it in front of people and eating meat sacrificed to idols, which is just going to push them over the edge because all the Levitical dietary laws, their brains can't handle it. they explode right in front of you. Just boom, you know. Um, and I'm joking, obviously. <laughs> They're just like, hey, you know, be cool, fool, man. Just be, you know, just try and be a little bit loving. And how you, it's the same principle that governed their letter to the Jerusalem churches. <clears throat> don't act in a way that's going to offend the Jewish community and destroy the church's witness. See, there's a difference between acts that we do as an expression of love for others as opposed to acts that we do in order to earn love and salvation from God. I like the way David Guzik puts it. He said, Paul did this not for Timothy's salvation, or for his right standing with God. That's not why he circumcised Timothy. Uh, But he did so, so that Timothy's status as a non-circumcised man from a Jewish mother would not hinder their working among the Jews and in the synagogues. Paul did things for the sake of love. I love this quote. Paul did things for the sake of love that he would not do for the sake of trying to please God through legalism. Well, let's wrap this up. How do, we, how, how do we apply this principle today? Here's how. And I'll do it by asking you a question. Is it okay for Christians to drink alcohol? Yes or no? Hmm. Is it okay for Christians to smoke? Can Christians smoke pot? Oh, wait a minute, it's legal. Well, what if the doctor prescribed it? Can they smoke pot then? Can a Christian go to a nightclub and go dancing? What if it's with their spouse? Is that cool? Can can a Christian watch an R-rated movie? Uh Oh, what what if it's the Passion of the Christ? Can we watch watch that? See, depending on who you talk to with these different questions, you're going to get a bunch of different answers. And the question that we have to answer is this. Where do we draw the line between liberty and legalism? Right, let me give you an example, alcohol. The Bible makes it clear that drinking alcohol is not necessarily sinful. And I use that phrase necessarily because there's, there's, uh, there's a few qualifiers, right? If, if you drink alcohol and get drunk, that is sin, right? So, so you can't do that. Um, 
Another qualifier is the Bible says, whatever's not of faith is sin. So if the Holy Spirit has convicted you and you say, I can't drink or it's sin for me, it is sin for you. You shouldn't drink, right? Or, you know, the Bible says we're to flee temptation. So maybe you, you just can't drink. Maybe for you, it's like, yeah, there's, there's, I have two ways of operating. I'm either sober or I'm drunk, right? And if I drink, I'm not gonna stop until there's no more booze. And then I'll get in the car and go get some more, right? Then you shouldn't drink, right? So there's, there's some qualifiers. But having said that, listen, <clears throat> maybe for you, drinking isn't sinful. And, uh, but you know what? Maybe for somebody you're with, it is, and you would cause them to stumble, right? And the idea is you gotta determine where people are at, and, and just, I, I'm, I'm going to be loving, and I'm going to be long-suffering. See, and, and the thing is, is that, how, we, how do we navigate this? The way we navigate it is through love. That's how we navigate it. This is what we see here in the Apostle Paul as he sets out to strengthen the churches. He's going out, and he's saying, man, uh, we're just going to be those people that are sacrificial. And, and, it, and it's going to cost something. For Paul, the sacrifice is, I'm going back to a place that beat me half to death. And I'm going to go back there, I'm going to love him. Timothy, for you to go with me, you're going to get circumcised. It's no picnic. But this is love. We're going to love these people in this way. <clears throat> Three questions as we close. Number one, ask yourself this. What's distinctive about my walk with God? What's my pattern? Uh, question number two, who do I mimic? And where is that leading me? Spend some time on that. Number three, ask yourself this, what have I sacrificed lately for someone else? <laughs>